So any questions from the first half? All right, so this is a good kind of segue into uh, the polynology stuff because again, ENT and poem is very, very much intertwined in a lot of cases. Shh, thank you. Um, anyway, so moving in uh, kind of along the same lines of what we were talking about before, more kind of cough and cold sort of common meds you're going to run into. So here's some antitussive slash expectorant agents. Um, again, cough. Uh, why do we cough? Yeah, you get the... the yeah, you have all these uh, receptors that can be activated, right? These little stretch receptors and things like that. So, like, you know, you can have things like chemical irritants, mechanical irritants that will trigger that cough response that's going to happen there. And it's actually very, very complicated as far as from a uh, mechanistic standpoint of how you actually develop that cough when it occurs. That's why you end up seeing, like, such high pressures and, and, and speeds of the, the actual, um, you know, the, the air that's being uh, expelled there, right? Which is why you should probably cover up when you're coughing because otherwise you're going to send your cooties out there to everyone, right? Um, but anyway, so, uh, and again, this is centrally mediated. So the, a lot of the drugs we're going to be using actually are going to be working more centrally to blunt that cough response. Okay. Not all of them. We'll look at some examples. Um, again, a lot of complications associated with it. It can be very problematic from a, a quality of life standpoint, right? Um, especially um, some costs, like for instance, there's a specific class of drugs we'll talk about later on that causes a chronic dry cough. And like, for instance, my cousin got started on it uh, and his wife was like, you got to get off this medication because it is driving me crazy. So not only the patient, but also people who are close to the patient. Uh, can also be affected by this as well, right? So our goal here is to try to prevent complications and try to see if we can relieve the number uh, of, or at least severity of the symptoms that are occurring here. I mean, the first drug we have here, it's called benzonitate uh, or Tesalon. You call them Tesalon pearls. Um, if anyone's ever worked with these uh, personally in the pharmacy, oh my gosh, these are the worst because, one, yeah. Well, for some people they work, but the thing I was going to say is, is they come these like, like some of them even come as like more like actual like spherical shape. And so again, one of the big skills of pharmacy is putting pills from a big bottle into a little bottle, like counting by five. Um, these things go everywhere. So it's not uncommon to try to pour some out and then you just have like a hundred of them just like all over the floor. And again, we don't have a five second rule in pharmacy. So again, you have to waste them at that point. We don't do that. We don't. Bless you. Plus it was like really expensive then it might, but no, I wouldn't do that. Just kidding. <laughs> Anyway, so these actually work by a different mechanism. These are actually going to be more anesthetizing on the actual cough receptors in the throat. So basically, you'll take these orally. We recommend you do not chew these or cut these up or anything because the liquid in there actually can cause uh, numbness of the tongue. That's actually one of the big side effects. So if you ever take this, don't chew it up. Um, but that numbing effect can actually curve back on those cough receptors and actually prevent maybe whatever irritant might have been there to cause cough and basically blunts that response. Your brain never, never gets the signal that, hey, I need to cough at that point, right? So very good from that standpoint. A lot of people will take it kind of as needed uh, basis around when they're having one of these, you know, kind of more viral illnesses or something. But that's really the big thing to know here is don't try to uh, chew it up, cut it, anything like that, because again, you're only going to find those kind of oral side effects associated with that. Now, the other big one you're going to see used most commonly orally, or at least over the counter wise, is going to be dextromethorphan. Otherwise, there's Robitussin. You see this is Delsum. Anyone know why I put Bender the robot here? Hmm? Robo tripping, yeah, absolutely. Oh, I guess the young people know all about robo tripping, huh? Bender the robot. Bender Rodriguez is his name. Uh, you can watch Futurama. No, Futurama, Futurama. Anywho. So I put him there for a reason, right? It's not just for, you know, for fun's sake, right? It's an uh, illustrated point. Anyway, so the way this drug works is actually going to be a derivative of uh, the opioid codeine. It's actually chemically very... Uh, strongly related. Now, in fact, any opioid, whether it be morphine, codeine, even heroin, can act as an antitussa. They have uh, strong anti-cough uh, actions within the CNS. They basically kind of blunt that response there. Well, again, we don't like to give out opioids just for anything, right? Because again, you want to use it, uh, reserve it for, for pain due to issues of, of addiction and whatnot. So dextromethorphan, though, while having the antitussa effects, limits any analgesic effects, which is why we like to use that, why it's available over the counter, okay? Uh, so it's very good from that standpoint. It's going to be able to activate some of these, or suppressing that med cough response um, and you have you know whether it be post nasal drip or some kind of chemical irritant anything that causes cough this can blunt that which is great um, the problem though what you're gonna see is that there's uh, some significant drug side effects to, to note about this some significant interactions this drug tends to be pro serotonergic so you remember when we talked about linazolid or Zyvox remember we talked about that one you don't want to mix with SSRIs due to the serotonergic toxicity this can actually help uh, can can work along with that right so you have to be careful because it will Increase serotonin type symptoms. If you're mixing this with other antidepressants, you have run that risk of having some of the symptoms develop there. So you'll be careful with that. We'll talk more about those in behavioral health later on. So don't uh, worry too much about that. The reason why I put Bender the Robot there is because there's something called robo tripping. So this is another common cough and cold product that people will abuse 
in order to get a high off of it. They will take very large doses of this. They call it robo-tripping because robo um, and they're tripping from it. So, uh, and, and they can become very severely symptomatic. So, again, it's one of those things where, um, you know, it's, it's a very harsh sort of high. Uh, a lot of people, patients will come in due to the fact they're having a bad trip, right? People don't come in if they're abusing drugs and having a good time with it, but they oftentimes will have a bad time and then come in because of that. And so we end up seeing, um, you know, some pretty severe hypertension, tachycardia. You see a lot of side effects. You don't normally see the drug exhibiting at normal doses, but when you drive it up that high is when you start to see some issues there. But a lot seizures, you know, hallucinations, all kinds of things. Um, so again, not a recommended thing to do. I definitely would not recommend robo-tripping to anyone, uh, at least based on the patients I've seen in the ER. But very good anti of agent, as you'll see. Um, all right. So moving on, that's kind of the majority of the over-the-counter stuff, cough and cold uh, products you'll run into. Now moving back to antibiotics, right? Because again, uh, infectious disease is a big reason for a lot of patients to present to you. And again, due to the, from the pulmonary standpoint, um, you know, this is, is going to be a big thing. Um, you're going to see that a lot of the bugs are going to be pretty similar to what we saw in the ENT, right? So what are the three main bugs we saw from like, you know, uh, talking about like, you know, sinusitis, uh, acute otitis media, what are the three big ones? Shake my head, right? So strep pneumo, Marxella, cateralis, and then H flu, right? Those are the big ones, big three. Um, you'll see a lot of those here as well, causing a lot of pulmonary disease, as we'll see. You're now, when you talk about pneumonias, you're gonna see that's gonna branch out pretty widely from there, as we'll see, it's a lot, lot wider. So the drug selection is gonna be uh, a little bit more variable, depending on what kind of bugs we're, we're treating, okay? Anyway, so again, with bronchitis, what's the primary cause for bronchitis in a lot of cases? A lot of times it's a viral, right? So very frequently do not need to treat this in any antibiotics. However, you're going to see that, you know, especially with acute bronchitis, it's going to tend to affect kind of all ages pretty much uh, uh, evenly. However, when we talk about COPD, if this chronic bronchitis that can develop, again, that's going to be more related to like patients who are smokers and whatnot. Um, we're going to see that's going to be treated a little bit differently. We'll see that later on as we get to, to that later. Anyways, as I mentioned, common causes are going to be the viruses. However, if it is going to be bacterial, this is where we're going to see things like um, uh, a few more uh, atypical bugs are going to be present here. So things like mycoplasma or chlamydia. So again, antibiotic selection is going to be a little bit different based off of this. We see things like uh, strep pneumo, staphylococcal species can be present here, and then H flu can also come up as well. What you sometimes will see is the patients will kind of start off with a more viral bronchitis and then develop into more of a bacterial. So sometimes it may start as one and then kind of morph into the other because the virus is kind of kind of primed the pump, so to speak, for the bacteria to kind of take hold in those cases there. Okay. So because of that, we're thinking about, you know, things like, well, you know, what kind of type of bugs are we going to be covering for here? And we're going to see the antibiotic selection is going to be more geared toward towards treating that, as we'll see. Um, mainly, though. The self-limited, you can treat with over-the-counter stuff for the most part, right? So as far as like antipyretics, what are some good antipyretics we have? Tylenol's a good one. Ibuprofen. Even aspirin could be used potentially. Who would I not want to use aspirin in though? Kids less than 16, right? Because again, if this is viral, I don't want to be giving them aspirin because I worry about Ray syndrome, right? It's good. So again, if I were to say like, hey, here's a patient I think has a viral bronchitis, which uh, these agents would be most appropriate for, you know, an eight-year-old um, with, with fever, right? So you need to key out that, okay, aspirin would be inappropriate in those cases there, right? Um, again, give, make sure you give them fluids if they're coughing a lot, antitussins are totally fine. Um, however, one of the things you will see is that you may want to avoid using things like antihistamines or sympathomimetics. They both tend to have those drying sort of effects, right? We talked about first generation antihistamines. They will dry out secretions. That can oftentimes will dry out, make those secretions more viscous and make them more difficult to expectorate. And so sometimes that can kind of harbor those bacteria and, and make a bacterial infection more likely. So it's again, one of those things, drink lots of fluids, you can cough up that stuff and get rid of it. Um, you know, it may prolong symptoms if you're using things to dry it out, so to speak. Now, typically, as I mentioned, antibiotics are not routinely recommended. However, if they're having more persistent symptoms, you know, greater than five days, that's where I start to consider more bacterial involvement. Now, we mentioned we want to cover for, what do we see? We saw the normal respiratory stuff like strep pneumo, H flu, but we also saw what? Atypicals, atypicals right? So what's going to help cover for atypicals? Macrolides are a big one. What else? Tetracyclines, right? Those are two of the most common sort of uh, atypical covering drug classes we're going to be using here, right? And who do I not want to use uh, tetracyclines in? Kids less than eight, pregnant women, right? Second, third trimester especially, right? So those are the two big groups you want to avoid uh, using, the, doxy, uh, using the, the tetracyclines in. So anyway, so again, if we are looking at this, and again, always go back to your, because this is a very common reason for people to come in, check your antibiogram, see what the, the local strains are becoming resistant to, uh, to make sure you have a little bit uh, more intelligent selection for your first line agent. Because again, are we going to be culturing all these patients? 
usually not, right? Usually if it's a, if you think of bacterial bronchitis, like we're just going to give them empiric therapy and if they don't improve, come back, maybe you'd start thinking about it, but most of the time you don't do that. So look at your local sensitivities and that will kind of guide you. Um, you know, things like doxycycline, very good drug if, uh, you know, as long as you don't have mycoplasma that has documented resistance against it. You know, if I work somewhere and it says mycoplasma pneumonia is going to be, you know, only 60% susceptible to doxycycline, is that a very good drug to use? No, I don't want a 60% chance to treat my patient. I want closer to 100%, right? You want to get that as high as possible. You can use things like macrolides. Azithromycin is going to be far and away the most common one you're going to use here. Again, longer half-life, usually only five days worth of therapy you're going to have to give with that. So azithromycin gets used most frequently. But again, resistance is always going to be a concern there, okay? And then occasionally you can use uh, respiratory fluoroquinolone. You probably want to reserve these, though, unless the patient has a history of really recent antibiotic exposure. And recent antibiotic exposure, why, why would that alter whether or not I'm going to use a fluoroquinolone because of resistance, right? So again, if I killed off, say, uh, some previous bugs that were growing in that, in that patient with antibiotics, there's a chance you could have more resistant bugs that are kind of taking hold at that point, right? Because again, these more resistant bugs may not be the most hardy bugs, but when they have an opportunity that comes up, say you wipe out the normal flora that might have been growing there, then they can start to, to kind of take hold. So in those cases there, that's why we want to use uh, things like fluoroquinolones as a backup in case we are suspecting that either they have a really resistant strain to something or if they've had been on antibiotics previously, right? And it's usually within the past month or so, or um, you usually use the past month. So again, because of that risk for that really resistant strep pneumo. And when I say respiratory fluoroquinolones, what am I referring to? Moxifloxacin is a good one. What else? Levofloxacin. Cipro does not get counted as a respiratory fluoroquinolone, mainly due to strep pneumo uh, uh, resistance. Okay, I mean, they're not going to find it has a lot of good activity there, so we do not use Cipro in those cases. Okay. So moxifloxacin and levofloxacin are two big ones. So that's bronchitis. Moving in, you're going to see a lot of uh, similar coverage here as far as um, when we're talking about community-acquired pneumonias. Okay. Um, now again, normally we're going to find that uh, the the airway is going to be uh, very good at getting rid of bacteria. Normally, the airway should be pretty sterile for the most part. But again, you may have things where you have the ciliary uh, cells are not going to be, or ciliated cells are not going to be able to get rid of that stuff very easily. Maybe you have smokers, maybe you have other chronic conditions that are kind of limiting that. Um, but usually, should be pretty sterile for the most part. But how do microbes get in? You know, it could be micro aspirations from the oropharynx. See, it's a lot in elderly patients, especially like uh, post-stroke patients, uh, dementia patients, that they are on CNS depressing drugs, things like that. It can have these kind of micro aspirations that will cause bacteria to get in there. Um, you see inhalation, you have hematogenous dissemination. So again, start out as a bloodstream infection, then got into the lungs. Um, or you would potentially have like some kind of direct inoculation, right? So if you had like trauma or something that could also introduce bugs there. So, um, and again, we'll, we'll delineate between community-acquired versus hospital-acquired pneumonia because, again, the, uh, into, uh, the, the microbial spectrum is going to be much different between those two. So we're going to look at those as two uh, different things there. But looking at community-acquired pneumonias, and again, does this include patients coming from a nursing home? No, it does not. It only includes patients who are coming, basically, they're out in their own homes. The nursing home is still considered a healthcare environment, right? Okay? Because, again, if you're going to be surrounded by a bunch of other people who all have their own cooties and their own bunch of medications and stuff, like that's still the healthcare environment, okay? So anyway... So again, most patients, especially if they're sick enough or not sick enough to require inpatient admission, um, they're going to be managed outpatient. You're going to find that empiric antibiotic therapy is going to be plenty fine, right? Um, you, know, you don't need to do a lot of diagnostic testing for that. You usually don't need to do a culture for those patients there, okay? Um, now, if you have to hospitalize them, that's where you're going to be. They're sick enough to warrant that, right? And you're going to be making that decision based off. There's several scales that are out there that can kind of help you with that. That's not my... That's not my uh, area of expertise, so you'll cover that in, a, in your med medicine class. Uh, however, there are scales out there that kind of help you sh show you just how sick is this patient. Do they need to come in or not, right? Do they need to go to the ICU or not? Based off of that, they're going to be coming in. Um, you want to get blood and sputum cultures, right? Why do we get a blood culture? Well, it could, it could be that they're septic, right? But also, again, we mentioned that hematogenous spread. Maybe it's a bloodstream infection. Maybe it's a more systemic infection that just hasn't really manifested itself. Or the pulmonary stuff is the first thing that really kind of showed itself, so to speak. Um, that, and you want to get uh, sputum cultures. Now, what's the problem with the sputum culture? Anyone know? Yeah. Well, any culture takes a couple of days, right? So, yeah, so again, you could have mouth stuff that's going to be contaminating that, but also you have a lot of, um, and again, most people's mouths are actually pretty gross when you get down to it, um, versus the lungs, which should be pretty sterile for the most part. So um, one of the big things you'll see with the sputum culture is you get a lot of contamination. So if you see a lot of epithelial cells in the sputum culture, that's usually just spit at that point, right? So again, because you can get a lot of epithelial cells from the cheeks and whatnot. So it can be limited utility there, but it can tell you if you get something like pretty obvious that grows on that. Um, with blood cultures, how many blood cultures do you normally take? 
You want to at least take two, right? You want to get them from different sites because one of the big problems is if you get something that grows staph epi, it's probably contaminant, right? But if I get staph epi from both, that probably tells me, yeah, there's actually a true infection there. So a lot of contamination can occur here, um, which is why you want to be careful with that. And again, when do I do the cultures in relation to antibiotics? Before, right? Because if I give antibiotics first, there's a chance it could be start to kill off those bacteria and it will not culture out. Okay, so big thing to note there. Again, as long as it's not feasible, I don't want to delay antibiotics by four hours because I'm waiting for the, the cultures to, to be taken, right? So again, all within reason there. So um, now you can do a sputum gram stain and a culture from that, it can be controversial just due to that contamination from, uh, you know, from stuff in the mouth. Um, and it's not always likely you're going to get a uh, the responsible pathogen there, right? It could be just something that was in the mouth that was just kind of just kind of growing there and not necessarily causing the actual disease you see with that. So again, be careful. Obviously, you know, if the the deeper in the lungs you can actually get to get an actual culture is going to be better. Uh, however, that's going to be much more invasive, right? So for instance, if I had a patient who was intubated, I can get a I can get a very good culture from that because I can get a, a nice BAL or something or bronchoalveolar lavage, right? Um, uh, or like a trach patient, they can be more difficult too because you have stuff kind of just kind of growing around that. They get colonized, all kinds of weird stuff. We're not going to get that specific in these cases. We'll talk about ventilator acquired pneumonias later, but yeah, trach patients are a whole other uh, bag of worms. Yeah. Um, so we want to, again, I mentioned there's lots of scales that kind of tell you where these patients should be managed at. Again, I'm not going to cover that specifically. Just know that they're out there. You'll cover these in other classes. Um, but what I will show you is that, you know, what are we thinking about as far as the bacteria that are likely to be causing disease here? And again, it kind of will be stratified based on kind of where they're going at, uh, going to for, for further management. What we find is that patients who are not sick enough to require inpatient admission, they can be managed on the outside. Typically, where they're going to grow back are going to be things like strep pneumo, mycoplasma, pneumonia, right? So now we have an atypical bug there. We see H flu, Mark's like hydralis, and then a lot of viruses, okay? So again, we're looking at the normal upper respiratory tract bugs, I shake my head as you so eloquently put it, and then you have mycoplasma pneumonia, right? So you think atypicals as well. So as far as coverage goes, you think what? Or what kind of drugs would I use? Just like we saw bronchitis, right? You're thinking tetracyclines, you're thinking uh, macrolides, right? That will help to cover a lot of these. Now, if they're having to go to inpatient side, maybe you just say, hey, you're sick enough to come to be admitted. You know, maybe your your O2 sats are not really that great on room air. You got you know a lot of really pretty high fever. You just look really crummy. You're not you have good oral intake. Let's go ahead and admit you. We're going to send you to the med surge floor, right? Um, this is where we're going to see a little bit different spectrum here. Right? You still have your strep pneumo, you still have your mycoplasma, um, but this is where you can see things like, you know, uh, Legionella starts to come to play a role here, right? This, that's another atypical bug. Um, you have things like aspiration pneumonias. Whenever you have an aspiration pneumonia, one of the big things you think about potentially is what? Anaerobes. Anaerobes, right? I will tell you, though, if you have an actual aspiration pneumonia, very frequently what you actually end up seeing is a chemical pneumonitis. That's actually one of the big things that um, you'll find, and a lot of residents get in trouble for this on the ICU. Uh, they'll say, oh, I was covering for, for, uh, uh, for aspiration pneumonia with this drug that covers for anaerobes, and the attendants will knock them down every time. They're like, they don't have an actual anaerobic infection. They just got all that stomach acid going into the lungs, and guess what that does to the lungs? Just like it does to food, it starts to, to tear it up, right? So you see stuff on the on that chest x-ray that looks like it could be pneumonia. It's really just a pneumonitis. It's just really inflammation due to that, that aspiration there. So again, unless you have a really documented anaerobic infection, oftentimes you don't have to worry about covering for that specifically. So just something to, to keep in mind. Anyway, and then if they're sick enough to really require ICU admission, this is where you're going to be thinking about things like staph is now going to be a concern here. This is where you see things like gram-negative bacilli. We're concerned about things like E. coli or uh, Klebsiella or you know, even Pseudomonas may be a risk here. This is where you're starting to think about that. Okay, And again, obviously the sicker they are, the higher the level, uh, the higher the acuity of care they're going to require, the bigger the guns we're going to use, right? The bigger the impure guns we're going to use, and then once we get cultures back, we'll scale those down as we can. It's a very good question. We're going to look at that in just one second. Great seg great segue. <laughs> anyway, so one of the big questions is as far as guiding our management is going to be whether or not we think we have resistant strep pneumo is going to be present here, right? So again, some of the things that are associated with more penicillin resistant strep pneumo are going to be things like the age of the patient, greater than 65. Um, if they've had a beta lactam drug within the past three months, it also makes them more likely to have a resistant strep pneumo. If they're an alcoholic, if they're immunosuppressed, right? Typically alcoholism, because it suppresses the immune system, if anything, right? So that's why they're more at risk there. Or they have a lot of medical comorbidities, right? So diabetes, renal insufficiency, anything those. And then also exposure to kids in daycare. What do you think that is? Because daycares are cesspits for bacteria, right? So again, every single, all those kids are on multiple rounds of antibiotics. They're all breeding grounds. That's probably where the downfall of humanity is going to come from is... Uh, <laughs> I will, I will tell you that my, my, uh, my nephew uh, was in daycare. He got back-to-back -back ear infections, like three rounds of antibiotics, and finally they put tubes in him. 
finally got him better. Send him back to daycare. Guess what? Ears draining again. Another ear infection. I mean, it's just it's just crazy. He'll have a great immune system when he's all done with that, I'm sure. But you know, it's one of those things where it's like there's a lot of really resistant cooties that get bred there. And so again, you have to think about well, do you have any young contacts, right? Do you know, do you have any kids that are in the house? Um, you know, an older patient, maybe they're taking care of their grandchildren or something like that. Okay. So anyway, so other things, you know, being at risk for enteric gram negatives is where think about like E. coli, Klebsiella, et cetera. Um, you know, do they live in a nursing home? As I mentioned, this is kind of a healthcare environment when you live in a nursing home like that. You know, any underlying cardiopulmonary disease, they have COPD, they have emphysema. Um, as I mentioned, uh, medical comorbidities and then recent antibiotic therapy is also playing a big role. Okay. And then kind of the worst of the worst is going to be pseudomonas we're thinking about uh, from empiric coverage. You know, do they have things like corticosteroid use? Corticosteroid use, what does that matter? Immunosuppressed. Immunosuppressed, right? Again, these are normal things you may be exposed to, but if you have a good immune system, you can fight off no problem, right? But these individuals are going to be sicker. Um, they're going to have malnutrition. If they've been on broad spectrum antibiotics recently, these things predispose them to getting pseudomonas. And again, that's going to require bigger coverage, right? We're going to need bigger guns to cover for that. And what did I say about coverage for pseudomonas? Double. Yeah, you have to double cover initially. Good. All right. So looking at this, based on uh, just for community acquired pneumonia for outpatient treatment, they have no ri uh, risk of resistant strep pneumo. So again, if it's just a normal, healthy patient developing pneumonia, they're coming to see you, maybe the urgent care, maybe the ER, if they happen to be. First line, go with the macrolide, right? You're going to have a good coverage against strep pneumo, moroxala, H flu, and you're also going to get that mycoplasma pneumonia, right? You get that atypical coverage there. Uh, is the third probably the most common one? Probably chlorithromycin. Second, erythromycin almost never, but may see it used occasionally. Second line, use doxycycline, minocycline, any of those are going to be totally fine, okay? Now, if they have resistant strep pneumo as being a risk factor, if you're worried about that, that's where you can go ahead and use something like a little bit bigger gun, like an amoxicillin with clavulonic acid. That can be a good agent to kind of help to, to overcome that. I would probably just go with augment in that case, right? Um, you can see things like a second or third generation cephalosporin could also be good coverage for this as well, okay? Or if the patient maybe could not receive a beta-lactam, maybe due to severe allergy, it's documented. Maybe you can use the, utilize the respiratory fluoroquinolone, so moxie or levofloxin in those cases there, okay? But again, try to really suss out to see if that's a really true beta-lactam allergy or not. Because if you can get away with using just straight amoxicillin clavulonic acid, that's always going to be better from a side effect profile, from a resistance profile, anything, right? So going in and moving into inpatient therapy, at this point, you're going to start to think about using more IV therapy, right? The benefits of IV therapy are what? 100% bioavailability. It's going to be quicker onset. They're going to get right into the bloodstream immediately. Um, good systemic coverage here. So typically, you're going to start off with an intravenous beta-lactam. You can do something like, you know, say a third-generation cephalosporin like cefotaxime or cefotriaxone. You can do something like uh, ampicillin plus um, or, or a high-dose ampicillin. You can utilize that. And then you want to use that in addition to the macrolide, okay? So you use azithromycin typically, and again, I'll, I'll, this is not something I'd quiz you on, but just so you know, um, usually you do not use IV macrolides for whatever reason. We do have it available, but we don't use it very frequently. So this might be a patient where they'd be on oral azithromycin, and they'll be on IV cefotriaxone or something, right? And again, that's so you have the uh, the azithromycin to get the atypicals, and then you have something like cefotriaxone to get kind of everything else you're worried about. Okay, that makes sense. Not necessarily the half-life, it's just one of those things that a lot of times it goes back to cost and, and things like that. It's just one of those things that, just like IV Bactrim, we almost never use IV Bactrim unless you have a really, like if you have an actual PJP pneumonia, that's someone who gets IV Bactrim, right? But we try to reserve it because there's a lot of other issues that go along with it. Um, cost is usually a big, a big player there. Another question? Yeah, as far as the cephalopaxin, the Either one of those are totally fine. Yeah, it depends on... Um, you know, usually see little kids, maybe they'll be more likely to get cefotaxin, but cefotaxin is nice because what's the benefits of, of rocephin? One time daily dosing, I don't have to worry about renal elimination. It's a great drug, so most people kind of fall back to that as being their default for sure. Uh, no, neither of those would have coverage against pseudomonas. And again, for someone who's just going to a non-ICU area of the hospital, you're not really thinking pseudomonas at this point, right? They're probably going to be a lot sicker if they really do have pseudomonas, or they're going to have a lot more um, comorbidities that are going to kind of predispose them to that, right? So again, we're still thinking not really pseudomonas at this point, still thinking resistant strep pneumo, mycoplasma, and things like that. It's kind of the typical uh, bugs you're thinking about covering. So you could do that, or you could do something like doxycycline. Or you could do something like a respiratory fluoroquinolone, but again, reserve those in case they have a beta-lactam allergy that, that's legitimate, okay? Now, again, uh, ICU, same as above, but you're going to make sure you're going with all IV therapy whenever possible. And then at this point, you also want to consider MRSA coverage, 
And what's a good MRSA covering drug? Vancomycin, right? It's a, kind of the go-to MRSA covering IV antibiotic, right? So again, worrying about community-acquired MRSA pneumonia used to be something we never thought about, but now it's becoming more and more prevalent. And so you want to think about this if you had a patient maybe on chest x-ray, so these cavitary infiltrates or something, or if they've recently had influenza, that also predisposes you to developing MRSA community-acquired pneumonia. On the gram stain, obviously you see a lot of gram-positive cocci uh, and clusters on there. Uh, in those cases, it requires either vancomycin, <clears throat> or if you cannot use that, for whatever reason, linazolid would be a good backup drug. Okay. So, um, moving on, then we have nosocomial pneumonias, when nosocomial just means hospital acquired, right? So we gave it to them, or they've developed it in the hospital sort of environment here. And again, this is going to be something that is not present at admission. Maybe they came in for something completely different, and then they developed it while they're with us, right? And I always say that being in a hospital is the last place you want to be to get healthy, right? Because again, you're just going to pick up all kinds of stuff the longer you're there. Um, so again, this is usually after 48 hours of admissions when they develop this. Um, so this can include both hospital acquired includes ventilator-associated uh, pneumonias and also healthcare-associated uh, pneumonias. We'll talk about these more specifically in a few uh, minutes here. Um, and again, this is the second most common nosocomial infection after UTI. UTI is probably the most common, followed by these pneumonias here. Okay. And again, bigger incidence in your elderly patients usually have a lot more comorbid conditions, also in those that are ventilated. Okay. And again, a lot more higher mortality. And do insurances want to pay for this? Heck no, they're going to say, no, they didn't have that on admission. All of a sudden they have a pneumonia. That's on you. You got to treat that now, right? So again, this is why things like infection control is absolutely critical in the hospital. Make sure you don't have patients giving cooties to one another and all that kind of stuff, right? All right, so anyway, so again, looking at healthcare-associated pneumonia, this is where you have patients who maybe have been hospitalized uh, recently, maybe greater than two days in the past 90 days. So again, we still consider that healthcare-associated, even if it wasn't developed directly in the hospital. Um, again, this may be something where they uh, get a readmission due to that infection that they developed, maybe while they're there, maybe it wouldn't really present itself right in there or there in the hospital itself. But again, long-term care, nursing home facilities, that have recent IV antibiotics also is considered that as well. Um, chemotherapy, because again, we're making them immunocompromised, wound care, hemodialysis, you know, anything where they have patients are having um, IV access done routinely can be something where they're gonna be more likely to develop infection, okay? So looking at that, we have some risk factors. Now again, when I say unmodifiable risk factors, what does that mean? I can't, I can't do anything about those, right? I do have uh, modifiable ones, though, that things that I can affect, the things that we can affect as a healthcare team, um, that those are the big things we're going to be focusing on. So, for instance, I can't change the age of the patient. I can't change their comorbid conditions um, or, you know, say when they get hospitalized, whether it's in the wintertime or the summertime. However, some things I can do, if I can get them off of the mechanical ventilation, that's going to be helpful, right? Um, if I can get them, get rid of any kind of like NG tubes, right? Anything, any kind of foreign material we're sticking to the patient is going to be a vector for bugs getting in. Let's get rid of those if, if possible, right? Um, that's kind of an interesting one. So H2 blocker or antacid therapy, we mentioned H2 receptors cause acid secretion within the stomach. Why do you think this would predispose someone to getting one of these pneumonias? Because it's decreasing your gut secretion of acid. So okay. It's like more likely to can pass on to your intestine. So, uh, almost. Uh, so basically by increasing the pH of the stomach, because again, less acid means the pH is going to go up. Normally, bacteria cannot grow in that environment. Maybe H. pylori can, but not much else can, right? So you're, by increasing that pH, bacteria can now start to grow, right? And what you'll end up finding is you have these micro aspirations that can occur. So actually through the respiratory tract, so up through the GI tract, through the respiratory, that's where you can see some of those bacteria tend to translocate, and that's how you can develop those infections. So that's one of the big things, though, because imagine someone who's in the hospital, Especially in the ICU, they are critically ill. Your body's responding to that critical illness by releasing a lot of what? A lot of cortis cortisol, right? So you're releasing a lot of steroids. Steroids do what to your immune system? They decrease it already, right? So again, also the other thing it does is it actually decreases the protective lining of the stomach as well. So when you have someone who's critically ill, you're balancing the fact of like, well, they're going to get a stress ulcer. Just like if you're stressed about your test all the time, right, you may develop stomach pain due to a stress ulcer. The same thing happens to ICU patients. So you're balancing that. So I'm trying to give them drugs to prevent that, but then also worried about the infectious, uh, you know, uh, sequelae of that, right? So again, these are things you have to, to balance out. So we're oftentimes we're trying to kind of, it's a double-edged sword in a lot of cases. So those are things you have to think about with these really critically ill patients, right? Um, Again, if they have previous antibiotic exposure, reintubation, all these things predispose them to getting one of these um, uh, nosocomial pneumonias. If we can prevent that, it's always going to be better. 
All right, so looking at the etiology here, and you're going to notice this is the widest range of different bugs that could be uh, causative here. So again, you have things like Pseudomonas, probably the most common one you run into from a gram-negative perspective. E. coli, Acinetobacter, Serratia, all these bugs are going to be uh, likely here. You're going to have gram-positive cocci as well. You're thinking strep pneumo, obviously, because that's a normal uh, respiratory bug, but also MRSA. It's another big common one you're going to run into from that standpoint. And then now you even have to start considering other things like, well, maybe it's a fungal infection right maybe they got this maybe they're immunocompromised we're giving them chemotherapy for their cancer and now they develop this pneumonia we're giving antibiotics but they're not getting better could be something like a fungal infection you have to think about at that point right and again, fungal cultures are really difficult to culture out they take a long time so oftentimes they're going to just get put on fungal treatment and then until you get something that proves otherwise right so again uh, it can be kind of problematic to get a really good uh, idea about what's actually causing the disease there anyway when you have one of these infections just go ahead and start as soon as possible. You don't want to have a patient develop a pneumonia and then wait to get a culture back before you decide to treat. So go ahead and use empiric therapy. And this is where we need really broad spectrum sort of antibiotics here. Okay. And again, we're saying um, we have to consider, do we need to cover multi-drug resistant bugs or not? We'll look at some risk factors for that in a second. But at the bare minimum, you have to cover for MRSA and pseudomonas. That means I'm at a bare minimum, how many different drugs? Uh, well, two for, just for pseudomonas and then... One for MRSA, right? You very rarely have drugs that are going to be able to cover those uh, pseudomonas and MRSA. There's one cephalosporin that does that, but again, that's not like a common go-to drug. So again, you're looking at a minimum of three drugs you're using for this patient, okay? So already we got a lot of drugs on board. But again, once you have the cultures back and you can streamline it down, that's going to be really, really important. The sooner you can do that, the better. So some of the things we're thinking about, you know, do we uh, do we worry about MDR pathogens or not? Some of the things we're looking at here, you know, uh, do they have previous antibiotics? Do they have a colonization? We see this a lot with trach patients that get colonized with uh, certain bacteria. You know, um, what's their hospitalization like? Do they have chronic care? Are they in a nursing home? You know, all these different things. Are they immunocompromised? These are all things that are going to put them at risk for having an MDR-related uh, bug. They're going to need a lot more broad-spectrum drugs, okay? So we'll look at the narrow spectrum versus the broad spectrum here in just a second. <clears throat> So if they have no risk factors for those MDR pathogens, this is where we're going to be shooting for something like a third-generation cephalosporin. Rocephin is the most common. And then something like a respiratory fluoroquinolone, right? So we can use something um, like levofloxacin, moxifloxacin. You know, if you're worried about atypical pathogens, that's a better one to go with. If you're worried about mycoplasma or Legionella, that's a good one to go with because that uh, fluoroquinolones will still cover for that. Um, or you could use something like uh, ampicillin sulbactam, right? Using a beta-lactamase inhibitor plus a beta-lactam, a good combination. Or you could use something like erdipenem. Now, if you remember, erdipenem is what type of drug? It's carbapenem, right? So it's in the same class as meropenem, which I said meropenem is like a nuclear bomb, right? This is the more limited one. This is like maybe the uh, just a, I don't know, just a regular bomb, I guess. I don't know if there really is a regular bomb. But this is a little bit small. It does not cover pseudomonas, though, is the thing. So erdipenem does not cover pseudomonas. This is good for those uh, patients who are really not thinking about those MDR pathogens. You're not likely to run into too many of these patients here. More than likely, you're going to run into those that really do have positive risk factors for a multi-drug resistant uh, pathogen here, right? So this is where you're going to need combination gram-negative therapy. So this means we're going to use an anti-pseudomonal cephalosporin. Anyone remember any anti-pseudomonal cephalosporins? Cefepime. Ceftazidine, we'll talk about not really using that frequently. You're absolutely right. It does usually have some pseudomonal coverage, but cefepime is a big one, right? Uh, anti-pseudomonal carbapenem. What do you remember? Meropenem, imipenem, also doripenem. I don't see that one used too often. All those would be, everything except for erdipenem, okay? Good. And then anti-pseudomonal penicillin. Zosin's a big one, right? So penicillin, or I'm sorry, uh, uh, piperacillin plus tazobactam, or zosin's a big one there. And then uh, plus, so you have one of those, so a beta-lactam drug working on the cell wall, right? And then I want something that's going to have a complementary mechanism here. So I want something like an anti-pseudomonal fluoroquinolone, maybe levofloxacin. Ciprofloxacin could be used here, right? Normally, we don't think about Cipro as being a respiratory fluoroquinolone. However, Cipro does have coverage against pseudomonas. So if that's what you were trying to cover for, then that would be acceptable. Most often, people just go with Levo, though, because, again, Levo can get both that strep pneumo if that was growing there or um, or the pseudomonas. The thing is, is if you have, like, Piperacillin tazobactam or if you have Cephapim on, that'll get that strep pneumo. That's not a concern uh, at that point. So that's why Cipro can be used there. Or uh, instead of a fluoroquinolone, you could use an aminoglycoside like gentamicin, Tobramycin, amicacin. Those are the three big ones there, okay? And then, so you get your two drugs from that category, and then you'd add on gram-positive coverage with usually vancomycin, or if not, you could do something like linazolid. Okay. So as I mentioned, 
Um, just real briefly, we'll, go, we'll cover these drugs again. Um, again, I'm not going to go into the mechanisms, but I'm going to talk about how they're uh, they're used specifically for these pneumonias. Fortaz or septazidine, not used routinely because resistance from the pseudomonas develops very, very quickly. So don't use that one uh, as your go-to. Cefepime, though, very good option to go with. These are all going to require renal dose adjustment, so again, watch that. Now, why do I uh, make a big deal about renal dose adjustment in these cases of these ventilator-associated pneumonias or these hospital-associated pneumonias? They're more likely to become very ill. They're more likely to develop things like sepsis. They're more likely to develop hypotension. They're more likely to underperfuse those kidneys and see kidney injuries. You've got to watch the renal function for these patients, okay? Especially if they have kidney disease to begin with, and that could have led them to be more likely to develop one of these multidrug-resistant infections, okay? So watch out for that. Watch your dose adjustments. For the carbapenems we mentioned, we have imipenem psilostatin. No, what was the big side effect I worried about with that? Seizure. Seizure, especially in renal patients you don't have an adjusted for. So instead, a lot of people end up going with meropenem. Doripenem could be used potentially, but merum is probably the most frequently one I see there. Again, renal dose adjustment. So the, the best option of That's what I see mo used most frequently. Um, I've only worked at one hospital where they even had imipenem on formulary and then but because of the seizure risk you don't really see that with meropenem i think a lot of places just use that by default you still may see it used occasionally um, from anti pseudomonal standpoint piptazo is going to be your your only go-to with this one so again zosin good coverage here um, again nice thing about zosin what else does it cover anaerobes which is good so if you're worried about actually having a true anaerobic uh, aspiration pneumonia, that could help to cover that as well. Ampicillin sulbactam will cover that uh, uh, also. However, ampicillin sulbactam does not cover pseudomonas, remember? So this is the only real anti-pseudomonal penicillin we have here. Uh, looking at the fluoroquinolones, again, Cipro, Levo, all these would be totally fine. They have good atypical coverage, so it'll help to cover like your mycoplasma, legionella, et cetera. They have good lung tissue penetration. Oftentimes what you'll find is that the lungs can be a little bit more difficult to penetrate than other areas. Like, so certain areas are just known to be difficult to penetrate. The bones are hard. The brains are – actually, bones are hard. They should be at least. Um, <laughs> but the bones are difficult to penetrate. The brain – uh, the lungs, those are all difficult areas to penetrate, and so that's a concern that we have. And so we'll talk about vancomycin in a second and how sometimes you have to shoot for higher doses to make sure you're actually getting and penetrating those tissues there, right? Um, but again, fluoroquinolones, try to use these judiciously whenever you can. Um, they're easier to dose than something like an aminoglycoside because you don't have to do therapeutic drug monitoring. However, uh, resistance is always a concern, um, so again, watch that. And again, adjust renally. All these ones you've had to so far. Uh, Aminoglycosides, any of them can be used. Nowadays, we're using once daily dosings, um, so that way we can give just a big dose one time a day, and then we'll check levels. Usually, we'll check a trough to make sure it's undetectable, to make sure it's cleared out of the system, usually around the third or fourth dose or so. Um, but be careful with that, because remember, what are the main toxicities that I worry about? Auto and nephrotoxicity, right? And again, if the patient already had nephrotoxicity to begin with, I can just exacerbate that even further, okay? Uh, next, we have vancomycin. Again, this is going to be used for the gram-positive coverage, mainly for MRSA. And again, notice we shoot for a higher trough normally. For like a normal bacteremia, skin soft tissue infection, I can maybe do like 10 to 15 as my as my trough that I'm shooting for, right? Because we do troughs because this is a timer concentration-dependent killer. Time-dependent. I want to make sure it's above that MIC, right? So by doing this, um, by shooting for a higher trough, I make sure I get better concentrations in the lung. And kill off the MRSA, hopefully, right? Um, I'm not going to have you memorize the actual levels, but I'll, I may put a, a question on a test where I'll give you a level and I'll say what the reference range is, right? Or I may ask you, why am I shooting for a higher trough for uh, a pneumonia than I would be for, say, another type of infection? You still need to know that, yes, I'm going higher doses because I need to get better penetration in the lungs, okay? Because, again, the blood level is just a surrogate for the level at the other tissues. I can't check a lung level of vancomycin. Otherwise, that would give me all the information I need, but that's not really feasibly done, right? And, again, ototoxic, nephrotoxic, especially with other meds on board. So if I have a patient who's on vancomycin and gentamicin for these infections, like, i got to watch the kidneys, right? They're the big, uh, big risk there. It depends. Uh, um, sometimes it could be reversal. Sometimes it could be one of those things where, you know, imagine your patient is ventilated. What do you have to do to ventilate a patient to make sure they're not going to try to get that tube out of their mouth? You got to sedate them, right? So uh, sometimes you got to paralyze them even, right? So again, if they're having ototoxicity, they may not be in a state where they can even tell you, hey, my hearing's getting a little more muffled here, right? I can't even hear anything because um, they're going to be sedated. So in those cases there, you may be going on for so long and all of a sudden by the time you get your patient up, they may not have any here, right? So it's one of those things where uh, if you catch it early, it could be somewhat reversible, but in a lot of cases it may not be. So, 
Uh, and then as a backup, if the patient could not get vancomycin, Zyvox is a good option here. We'll cover MRSA. Again, for these patients, you'd probably be sticking with IV therapy. Good penetration, but very expensive. So we like to hold this one back whenever possible. This one's unique because it does not require any dose adjustment. So for patients that really kind of, um, you know, labile sort of uh, renal function, this may be a better option than vancomycin, but most of the time, you try to use vanco whenever you can. Okay, so again, once you get the cultures back, that's when you can start to scale down therapy. You can try to switch over to PO if possible. Again, it's going to be better from a, uh, from a cost standpoint. What's the other benefit of going from IV to PO? Decreased infectious uh, risk, right? Because again, anytime you have an IV line in a patient, the longer you have that there, it's again, it's another vector for the uh, bacteria to get in. So you got to watch for that, right? Um, now, if you have failure of therapy, the question is why, well, why did my therapy fail? Patient's not improving. What's going on here? Uh, could be the wrong therapy due to resistance, which your culture should show. Could be you have inadequate antimicrobial therapy. Maybe you didn't count on that the patient actually had an MRSA pneumonia. You didn't cover wide enough to begin with. That could be something. Um, you have a wrong diagnosis. Maybe it wasn't actually a pneumonia in the first place. This is actually PE they develop, right? So you have to consider that. Um, and then also the complications thereof, right? So C. diff colitis is going to be a big one. Again, if I'm giving vancomycin, gentamicin, and zosin, I'm wiping out everything, basically. So there are big risks for C. diff. You have to watch out for that, right? Um, and then usually for treatment duration, usually around seven to eight days or so. You may need to treat for longer, though, with some of these more um, difficult to treat gram-negative bugs like Acinetobacter, Bumani, um, Burkholdia cepatia, things like that. So again, some patients are going to require longer therapy. All right, so any questions on pneumonias? I know it was a lot, but again, it's kind of a review of a lot of drugs we've already covered, but it's just how do we specifically use it for this indication, right? So kind of review those, and those are the big things we're going to be focusing on. You know, I still may ask questions about, like, which one of these is going to be likely to cause renal toxicity in this patient being treated for pneumonia, right? I may ask questions about that, so that's good stuff to know. Um, but again, know the kind of the details. Why do I not use Cipro for typical community-acquired pneumonia? Like, why would I, but it's okay to use for these multidrug-resistant nosocomial infections, right? So those are kind of the things to kind of key in on, right? Anyway, moving on. Next, we have anaphylaxis treatment. So again, anaphylaxis, what is that? It's a severe acute allergic response, right? Why do, why do I care about it? Life-threatening, right? Because it's going to be causing a lot of bronchoconstriction. We saw earlier that when you have all that histamine being released and all these other mast cell uh, products being degranulated, you're going to cause smooth muscle constriction. You're going to see uh, mucus secretion in that airway. You're going to see hypotension develop because all the blood vessels are going to be dilated. Um, it's a very, very severe uh, reaction. Again, it's kind of, it's, it can be on a scale, right? You can have patients who are coming in full-blown, my throat's closing up. You can have certainly many gradations in between, between just a little bit of itching all the way to the full-on, you know, I need to crike this patient because they're uh, are losing their airway and I can't intubate them anymore, right? Um, so these are things uh, uh, to consider here. And again, our therapy is going to be tailored based on their symptoms that they're experiencing here. But we'll talk about all the drugs we use for these anaphylaxis uh, patients. First thing, Volume expansion. You want to give them some fluids, right? So it'll be an easy thing to get started. So you're getting your IV started. Um, this may not be the first drug you give, but because they get hypotensive, one of the things you want to do is try to fill them up intravascularly to try to get their pressures back up. And so one of the things we'll do is going to be with IV crystalloids. When I say crystalloids, what does that mean? Something with a solid, right? So as opposed to something like albumin, albumin would be a colloid. So it's more protein-based, but these are going to be crystalloids we're using here. And we have normal saline, right? 0.9% normal saline. Why do we call it normal saline? It's about the same tonicity as our blood, right? So it's around 300 milliosms per liter. It's around the similar concentration of sodium as our blood. You know, uh, the sodium content uh, of a liter of saline is about 154 milliequivalents per liter. What's our normal sodium level? Yeah, well, yeah, 135 to 145. So we're about 140, so 154 to 140, pretty close, right? So again, that's why it's normal saline. It's kind of very similar to what our normal blood uh, is like anyway. Now, again, we're going to be trying to fill up their intravascular space. Now, we've talked about, um, you know, the, the dosing for, for fluids before. It'll come up here again, right? So, again, a normal fluid bolus for a patient, 20 mLs per kilo, right? These are just good numbers to know because you can go on rotations and be like, hey, I need to give a patient a fluid bolus. How much do I give? You can figure it out pretty quickly, right? So, 20 times their weight, you'll get a fluid bolus, usually about one to two liters. However, for some of these really severely shocky patients, you may need much more than that. So, just be aware this is a starting dose. You can go up from there. Okay. Again, you can always get more fluids, but you can't take it back once you put it in the patient. So be you know, somewhat judicious about how much you're going to give immediately. Um, and then once you kind of get them repleted, once you get the pressure back up from the fluid standpoint, then you can start to think about the maintenance dosing, right? Remember how we do that? Four, two, one rule, right? So again, this is going to be more specific for pediatrics, but you can use it for adult patients too. It's no problem there. Um, again, four mLs per kilo for the first 
10 kilograms is 2 mLs per kilo, the second 10, and then 1 mL per kilo for every kilo after that. You can go back and review those videos. They're all up on YouTube. You can go back and watch them all. And I'm sure you watch them already every single day just to just refresh yourself, remember all the good times we had. Um, but go back and review that, right? So, for instance, if I had a 60 kilo patient for the first 10 kilos, it's 4 times 10, we get 40 mLs per hour, right? For the second 10, 2 times 10, we get 20 mLs per hour. So now I'm up to 60 already. And then for every kilo after that, another 40. So again, 40 plus 20 plus 40, you get 100 mLs an hour, okay? It's a good quick way to know, you know, what kind of fluid uh, I need to give this patient. And again, the more you do it, the more you can just do it automatically. Like we get fluid orders all the time over at the hospital, the you know, Pete's hospital. We can just figure it out immediately, right? Um, because again, the doc will order something or provider will order something. I can just do the math and look at the weight, figure out what they should be, make sure it matches up, and then we're good to go, right? So this is just for hypertensive or even for sepsis patients? This, this could work for sepsis patients too, but remember like any of these like really sh shocky looking patients, they may require a lot of fluids from the bolus standpoint before you get them on the maintenance dose, right? Um, so maybe you know pumping you know, a ton of liters of fluid into them and then you'll worry about the maintenance a little bit later on, right? But I just illustrate it here just so I can reiterate the point and try to drive, you know, try to facilitate those little neuronal connections and re remind you of all of that. Anyway, the, the number one life-saving drug, if you have a patient who is going to be going into full anaphylaxis, is epinephrine, okay? Epinephrine is an endogenous catecholamine. We all have epinephrine, you know, especially like before test time, before the quiz next week, you probably have a lot of epinephrine you're going to be uh, experiencing. By acting on alpha receptors, it's going to do what? Vasoconstriction, right? So it's going to get our pressures back up, okay? So the vasoconstriction plus that fluid we've now put in to fill the tank, we're squeezing on that tank, now we have good uh, pressure hopefully, right? Now on the beta receptors, what is that gonna do for us? Which, which beta receptor specifically? Beta, beta two on the lungs is gonna cause smooth muscle relaxation, okay? That's gonna be good, that's gonna help to open up the airway a little bit for us, right? And allow for better oxygenation to occur. Now what's it gonna do to the heart? It's going to speed it up, right? Because again, beta-1 receptors in the heart are going to be activated. That's going to increase activation there. So you see the tachycardia, hypertension, you know, see that airway uh, smooth muscle starting to relax. That's all going to be, um, you know, the, the tachycardia is not necessarily a good thing we're shooting for, but it's going to be one of the things you're going to see regardless. Yeah, it's going to be active for both alpha and beta. The other thing to think about is remember when you're thinking about uh, these patients cardiovascularly, their blood vessels are dilating like crazy. They're very hypotensive. What does the heart want to do to respond to that? Increase the cardiac output because your TPR goes down, cardiac output has to go up to balance that out. So by how does it increase cardiac output? The stroke you may increase stroke volume and also and the, heart rate. the heart rate, right? So again, remember the stroke volume times the heart rate is going to be your cardiac output. So by increasing the speed of the heart, how fast it's beating, and by increasing the contractility there, you're going to try to increase cardiac output. Epi is going to help with that as well. But the big thing we're using Epi for is to get that blood vessel constriction, right? Because we want to get that pressure up so we can perfuse the organs better, okay? Um, and again, this is also going to help with alleviating things like the pruritus, urticaria, angioedema developing here. This is going to help with all of those symptoms. So this is why epi is the life-saving drug when you have an anaphylactic patient. This is the first thing you want to give them, okay? Now, typically, most patients who have a history of anaphylaxis, they absolutely should be given a prescription for EpiPen. They should have that available. They should carry it around with them all the time because you never know when peanuts may strike, right? You never know when you're going to find a peanut in something or whatever their, their allergen happens to be, right? It could be something very specific. You're never going to run into it or it could be something that is very ubiquitous, right? Um, so they should be carrying this around. Now, do all patients do that? No. In fact, I've had some parents who their kids two or three years old um, and they come in for anaphylactic reaction. They're like, mom, you had a, you had a prescription for EpiPen. What happened to it? They're like, oh, I left it at home on accident. Like you find some people are just not going to be the, all that diligent about this sort of thing. So let's consider that. Um, again, that's why they come to the ER so we can treat them there. Um, we'll get to antihistamines in just a moment, but thank you for the segue, yeah. So that's getting ahead of us, right? Even if the medication has expired, we can keep it just to have it as like a backup. Epi, I don't know. Epi is one of those things that tends to have, uh, it tends to be a little bit more sensitive to degradation. Um, you know, it's a little bit more sensitive to the light. I would be, most drugs, Again, most drugs, I would say, if it's expired, just go and give it, right? Um, like, you know, liquid antibiotics, probably not. That part of the stuff degrades pretty quick. Epi, I would, if it was between no drug at all or maybe some expired epi, yeah, go and give it, right? But you may find it's going to be less effective than, than normal. Because what's, what's kind of been the controversy with EpiPen for a while? Cost. The cost, right? Because, again, these manufacturers are trying to make money off of this sort of thing. And it becomes, it comes as this very specific auto-injector. It gets very expensive, right? And so again, it's, it's been a big controversy as far as you know. Some patients will do things like 
try to find Canadian pharmacies where they can get their medication shipped to them for a lot cheaper. I don't fault them for any of that because, again, it's very, very expensive for a life-saving medication, right? Um, anyway, but typically, when you're going to be giving this, either intramuscular or subcutaneous is the typical route. Intramuscular is the thing I will say give nine times out of ten, right? Because, again, when you get a hypotensive patient, you're not perfusing the skin. You're not perfusing the muscles as well normally, so you tend to find more erratic absorption. So that's one thing I just say go ahead and give IM. And all the EpiPens are designed to be given intramuscularly, right? And so but even over clothing, right? So you don't, the patient does not have to disrobe necessarily. They can just go ahead and take the pen, inject it uh, to the anterolateral aspect of the thigh, and get the medication in. Even go through jeans, can go through uh, typical clothing, no problem, right? It has a nice needle. Uh, as soon as it gets compressed, down the needle will, will jam out it will inject the drug the big thing to note uh for your patients make sure they hold it there for like say five to ten seconds okay um there's actually some newer ones that actually can talk to you and actually uh, walk you through the whole process when you like, pull the tab which is nice um but have them hold it there because again they're going to be kind of scared to do it or have someone else do it for them right so again have it sit there make sure they get all the drug injected and then pull it off okay um i don't know if it necessarily helps at, at all i mean you're going to be you know, uh, the patient's own immune system, our own, uh, uh, you know, uh, sympathetic system is going to be going over overdrive anyway. You know, I think the, that blood flow and the, the cardiac output, you're going to be fine. It gets absorbed okay from that standpoint. Um, but it wouldn't hurt, I would say. Uh, yes, ma'am. Do you only inject it in the thigh? Or that's the most common one because, again, these patients may be self-administering it, and so that's going to be the easiest thing to administer. I wouldn't want to try to inject their butt or something, right? <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, then uh, IV would be the, the way we would give it in the hospital, right? So again, this would be more uh, reserved for patients who are actually having like a full on like, you know, uh, cardiac arrest due to anaphylaxis. That's when we'd switch over to using IV therapy. If they're coming in and they're having a normal anaphylaxis, I, I am is still the way we administer it nine times out of 10 in the hospital, right? Um, so again, there's a, there used to be a lot more concentrations that are available. You're going to find two main concentrations that are out there. The only thing I'll, I'll kind of belabor at this point right now is to make sure you know which concentration you're using. And this is going to be important depending on which route you're administering it. So for IM, do I want more concentrated or less concentrated? Well, more concentrated, right? Because again, injecting large volumes of drug into the, the thigh can be painful, uh, may de uh, decrease the absorption. Um, you know, if I'm giving 0.3 milligrams, that's a usual adult dose for um, uh, epi, I can either give 0.3 mLs or I can give 3 mLs. Which one do you think goes in the thigh easier? 0.3, right? So I can give a smaller amount, so I use more concentrated for the intramuscular form. IV, we like to give uh, the less concentrated form. That allows us to titrate our dose a little bit better, right? It's easier to give 3 mLs and not actually screw it up and give too much or too little. Um, that makes it a little bit easier for us. But anyway, side effects you'd expect to see. What do you, what do you expect, do you think? Tachycardia. Dizziness, maybe. Yeah, hypertension, you can see the opposite effect. Maybe you gave too much. Anything that is indicative of the sympathetic nervous system, right? So you're going to see sweating, you're going to see tachycardia, you're going to see anxiousness. You're going to see, a lot of things you're already experiencing anyway uh, can be exacerbated by this, right? So just be aware that you're going to really be ramped up there. Um, now, be careful with the dosing because, again, if I were to screw up and give the, say, the, the more concentrated form at the dose that I was using of the less concentrated form, you can cause patients to stroke out, right? You can cause very severe uh, uh, vasoconstriction, and, and it can be potentially deadly there, right? So you don't want your patient to come in for anaphylaxis and then you give them a stroke. Uh, look pretty bad on you, right? So you don't want to do that. Pretty bad for the patient, too. Anyway, so that's, a, that's a, the number one thing they need to get immediately, right? You're getting the fluids going. Oftentimes in the hospital setting, you're getting multiple people working on different things at the same time. So you've got one person getting the epi ready. You've got one person getting the fluids getting ready to hang. Um, you're also going to be worried about antihistamines, okay? So are we worried about H2 blockers or H1 blockers here? H1 is the primary thing. So again, if you had to give one, I would give the H1 blocker. Oftentimes you're going to find the H2 blockers get given additionally. Um, that's going to be helping with the GI side effects. Because again, you're releasing all that histamine. Histamine itself doesn't know whether it wants to affect H1 or H2. So if it's getting released kind of systemically, it'll affect the GI tract too. So you'll see that increase HCL production and whatnot. Um, so very frequently we'll give H2 blockers. Um, Ranitidine or Zantac is the most common one you may see being given. We'll talk about that later in GI, so don't uh, fret over, over that too much. Um, but big H1 blockers, uh, diphenhydramine or Benadryl is the most common one we use IV. And again, IV therapy is going to be uh, recommended here. Now, I've not heard too many people talk about sub uh, sublingual diphenhydramine, but um, you know I think oral would be totally fine in that case there. I don't know if you necessarily get a lot bigger bang for your buck from absorption. Um, sublingual, I, it's not something I've heard of at least, but maybe talk to an allergist, maybe they have it. Well, I know my mom, she had like an allergic reaction. Yep. And she noticed that if she would have taken it just oral, mm. it wouldn't, the effect wasn't there like quick enough. So okay. she would do sublingual and then she would, on her 
I think the effect will come in like within like minutes, 10, 20 minutes or something. Yeah, so maybe that work a little bit better for um, ideally if we can switch so if like EMS is, is responding or something like IV is going to be preferred in those cases or IM uh, if you have to give it. But yeah, it could be something you could do potentially. But it helps to relieve a lot of the, the rash. It'll help with the, the vasodilation. helps with all those other symptoms, right? So it's a good adjunct to the epinephrine, right? It's going to be able to help. Um, now, in some cases, you may find patients who will present with allergic symptoms. They're not so severe that they need the epinephrine. So in some cases, you may just go, hey, I'm going to give the H1 blocker, and then we'll talk about the steroids as well they're going to use along with that. So epi is not always having to be given, but for the more severe reaction, the life-threatening reactions, epi is going to be given. So you have a patient who's having their throat uh, sort of feel like it's starting to swell up, they're going to get epi, right? If they have a patient who um, is hypotensive, they're going to get epi, right? For lesser reactions, though, H1 blockers and steroids are going to be more the, the mainstay there. So, so let's say if it doesn't work and you have an, another one, can you give another one or just wait for From the, the epi? Yes. Um, occasionally, we will give another dose. Usually we'll see kind of how the first one's going to do. If they continue to progress and get worse and worse, they're kind of moving towards cardiac arrest sort of uh, territory, then we may need to give more doses. And one location over the other doesn't matter? Um, we would probably rotate it because, again, the thing you think about is when you inject that epinephrine, you're causing vasoconstriction. If you inject it in the same place again, you may limit that absorption, right? So I'd probably do it maybe the other thigh or you can do it in the deltoid or something like that. They're being uh, the healthcare providers giving it. Right? The thigh is just uh, easier for, for patient self-administration in those cases. All right. Um, now, as far as bronchodilators, sometimes we'll actually be giving things like albuterol. We'll talk more about this in asthma later on. But as a beta-2 agonist, this will help to relax that smooth muscle and allow, uh, for easier oxygenation. This is not going to uh, overtake the place of something like epinephrine. But if you don't have IV access yet, if you can't give the epi just yet, you can sometimes uh, it's very quick to get uh, an albuterol and that going. So sometimes that would be a good adjunct. Not going to be the thing to fix them usually, but it could be uh, could be helpful there. And we'll talk more about this later. But you see a lot of um, uh, similar sympathomimetic effects, like with the epi, just less severe with, uh, with albuterol. So you get you know, some tremors, some anxiousness, and tachycardia associated with that. And then the last thing you're going to give is going to be the steroids. Now, looking at the the uh, the onset of effect, which of these drugs do you think would be working quickest? And it hits me working pretty quick. What would be even faster than that? Epi. Epi is going to be working the fastest, right? So Epi is going to have the biggest effect, the quickest effect here, right? Now, on the slowest side of things, corticosteroids, right? These are going to take time to work. So, for instance, like, you know, I'm in the ER, uh, and they say, oh, we got this anaphylactic patient. We've got to get steroids right now. I was like, you got to get the Epi right now. Like, that's the thing you got to get on board. The steroids can take away a few minutes. If it's a few minutes delayed, I'd rather get the Epi going, get the, the diphenhydramine going, I'd rather get the fluids going, and then the steroids can kick in a little bit later, right? It's going to take a few hours before you really see those effects there. And the other big thing is they kind of blunt the kind of the secondary sort of allergic cascade that happens a few hours later anyway. So this is good for good sustained anti-inflammatory action, but this is not the thing that's going to save their lives immediately, right? The Epi is going to be the thing that's going to be life-saving in those cases. Um, but of course, you know, when you're in the emergency setting and someone's, you know, airways closing off and you're like, you're kind of, you're a little ramped up anyway and jumping and trying to get everything going. So you'll get a nice calming presence. Like, that's okay. We'll get that going, but let's get the epi first and then we'll worry about that. <laughs> anyway, so the, the big ones we, we like to use here, again, we're going to more focus on using more IV therapy, a parenteral therapy when we have someone who's going to be more severe. If they're coming in and they're having, you know, just a little, maybe some urticaria, you know, feel a little uncomfortable, we'll give them some Benadryl orally. We may give them some prednisone orally. Um, but for the more severe reactions, we switch over and use something like methylprednisolone, okay? So methylprednisolone is kind of like your go-to IV corticosteroid in most like emergency sort of cases and a lot of these respiratory cases we use methylpred as our, as our go-to. Anyway, um, so yeah, those are the main uh, group of drugs you're going to be using for anaphylactic treatment. Okay, so again, if I were to ask you on a test, you know, uh, which of these drugs would you want to administer first? In case of anaphylaxis, you're going to say FEV, the first one to go with, right? If, uh, I said, you know, patient, um, you know, I'm trying to think of another good example I can think of. Um, you know, or if I said the patient comes in, they're having a little bit of urticaria, but no other symptoms. Give an, yeah, give an H1 block, right? They may not necessarily need that, that epi. And again, if I'm asking a test question about that sort of thing, I'm going to make it very clear which one you need to give. I'm going to be like, patient's about to be intubated. Which one do you want to give? Probably epi, right? You probably want to give some epi in those cases there. Um, yeah. No, we're going to do some oral steroids. It's like, no, no. No, no, we're gonna need some parental therapy, right? So again, um, it'll it'll be pretty clear on, on the case as far as like you know, because I'm not expecting you to be experienced clinicians at this point, um, you know. So it'll, it'll be very very clear cut from, from that. Anyway, yes, ma'am. If they're having like a very severe reaction, are we gonna utilize all of those? You would end up using all of those, right? So you get the epi going, you get some fluids running, you get the antihistamines and the steroids. Absolutely, yeah. So you get the they call it the full court press, right? When they need everything to to help kind of manage that the anaphylaxis. They may need less than that if it's a less severe reaction, but uh, they're really having 
throat swelling, if they're getting hypotensive, like, yeah, they're getting everything, basically. Okay. Any other questions? All right, I'm going to let you go right now. This will be the end of the material for the quiz next week. So it can include optho. It can include the ENT stuff and include up through up to this asthma slide. Not this slide, but everything before this slide. Okay. No questions. I will try to do it on Canvas, see if we can get that working. Uh, I'll have paper copies just in case there's a catastrophic error, uh, which is likely. No one my, my luck, but um, we'll go from there. Okay. All right.